Helen of Four Gates by Ethel Carney Chapter 8 The End of the World Helen was alone in the shadow-filled kitchen. She was lying on the old settle before the fire, listening in a dull fascination of horror to the ticking of the clock. There were only two hours now. Then Martin was going away. The milk kits were to scold yet. She had gone on strike. She had played the trump card of feminine helplessness, much as it had hurt her proud spirit to do so. For two days she had feigned illness, starving under Martin's eyes. She was parched with thirst and afire with hunger. The smell of food from the table behind her, where Martin had spread her a meal before going out, came to her like a temptation, but to eat meant to bring back the colour to her lips, Sweet meant, therefore, to make it easier for Martin to get away. She was treading down the regal pride of her heart. She was appealing to him as beggars, lepers, children, mangy animals appealed to the human pity in the human heart. Oh, the pain, the ignominy of it, to be crying out to Martin's pity, to be saying literally, If you leave me, I know not what I shall do. Her hands clenched together under the coat that covered her. The indignity, the helpless futility of it. To be proud, yet to have to throw pride away. To be courageous, yet to learn the meaning of fear. To be sane, yet to fear that one might go mad. To know oneself greater even than the thing it loved. In all these things, yet to have to plead to that thing as a cripple pleads at a cross. The mockery, the spite of it, surely the fires of hate were as heaven to the fires of love. Martin said he was going. She had begun to believe it. He had only to come back for his wages and his box. That box stood near the settle end, strapped, labelled, ready for his going. The blasphemy of it shuddered through her. He was leaving her, her to whom he had said in that moonlit field with the edge of foam-white blossoms, I love forever, forever, forever. She had believed it then, she had believed it since, but to say that, then to go away. There were some who said it and forgot, some sooner, some later. But Martin, did it come to everyone who loved the most? So with such a horror of surprise and dull ache that the one they loved could be unfaithful. Love was for glory or shame, but Martin was leaving her as people left infected houses, as rats left sinking ships. He had kissed her. He knew the taste of her lips, he and none other. He knew the croon of her voice. He had seen her proud wild soul in all its nakedness, she had followed him across the moor, calling his name until strength had given out. Had he called her so, she could not have gone a yard. That was the first incense of her pride that she had to cast on the fires of love, odorous with sacrifice. Since then she had starved, starved to make herself pale, that the paleness of her lips might strike to his heart. She had given him the key of her heart, there were women who only gave to men the key of their faces, but she, Martin, knew her heart. Wherever he went he would carry the key, and he was going away. He had said so. All four gates had rung with it by this. It seemed that every stick and stone in the lanes must know that Martin Scott was going away, that she was being left, even as Joe Gillibrand left Sue Marsh all those years back. Sue Marsh's body had been found dead that morning behind the door, the blind white cat licking her face, the face Joe Gillibrand had once brought the colour to, with his coming and going. Whenever Alan opened her eyes, she saw the ghost-like animal that had belonged to the dead woman, crouching inside the fender. Martin had brought it to the farm to be cared for, Martin was kind to cats. She put out a weak hand touching the box. A half scream left her lips as she touched it. It was real. It was Martin's box with the key of her heart inside it to be carted away. 
She fancied that something must happen to stop him. Then it crossed her mind that Sue Marsh would have had the same thought years ago. The gods were not to be trusted. She must do something. Yet she stared hopelessly into the fire. Across her memory came the recollection of that little scene two nights ago, as he had stood hypnotised by a little white dust. Here in four gates, she was fighting for her soul. Might she not play that white magic of dust once, for her soul to be greater than the gods? Her cheek flushed. She was laughing tremulously. What was her little pride? Throw it away, the last sacrifice. But she frowned into the fire. She was proud. The narrow tenets of four gates hemmed her round at times. It was so little that pride, yet losing that, what was she? No, no, she could not lose Martin, she was a savage, there were no pale beautiful saints with halos of dim gold in her childhood, her friends had been will-o'-the-wisps, witches, bar guests, creatures of power, who could raise the quick and the dead, these breathed to a win, win, that only defeat was ignoble, these earthbound spirits who hovered over the blowing bents, the wind-paled rushes, those creatures who had stirred the potion in the black pot that had the force to overcloud the stars. Like Martin's childish saints, these also were bloodless, but they had in them the breath of the hills and moors. They were close to the earth and of it, whilst his saints were remote and cold. What was it? It was only to play the spirits of her childhood against his, earth against heaven, life against death, love against reason. It was only, but Forgate sat in judgment in her heart. It was so little that was left. But if she threw it away, she would be nothing, nothing any more, no roots to her. So she felt. She would have plucked herself up from the foundation and then, the creak of the gate came to her, the sound of a step. She listened, hoping that it was not Martin. For once she too wanted to think, time to think. It was Martin's step. She sat without moving. He advanced into the circle of firelight. He stood with his back to the fire looking at her. The firelight wove a spell about her. He had barely looked at her for two days. In two hours he would go away. He might look at her now. That memory should be the only thing he would keep of four gates. Everything else, every thread, his old clothes, should be flung away. But that little memory he might keep. He was leaving four gates. Never again should his eye glance upon it, on the hills around it, the trees in its fields, the places where he had hedged and ditched. He was leaving Ellen. On both he might let his eye wander lovingly for the last time. On neither must he look too long. He knew that. He was looking at her now. It had always seemed to him that there was something about in the firelight that he never saw at any other time. One might have expected her to make passes on the air and do what she would as she sat with the shadows about her and her long hair black as night. It was hard to believe that she was like the rest of mortals, limited in strength and powerless to mould her own fate, struggle as she might. Well, queried Martin, looking down at her, now to say. She moved her head from side to side. Her eyes were hidden. They were looking down at Sue Marsh's blind white cat. Won't to wish me luck, Ellen? asked Martin. She laughed without looking up. It was a little mocking, weary tone laugh. Then she looked at him. Her eyes had that vivid greenness that reminded him of a cat's. I wish they looked, Martin Scott, she said, very slowly and deliberately. She spoke in the same tones as those that had struck fear to Andrew's heart in that wet red wood years back. If she had not the power, her desire, her willingness to play with elemental fires, was as great as that which had burnt in the heart of the wildest witch in the country. Aye, said Martin, uneasily, but there's all sorts of luck. Why should I wish the ill? she asked, 
in a way that made him wonder whether or not she spoke in bitter jest or quiet earnest. Why should I wish thee ill? That would be wicked. Besides, were wishing any good, thou wouldn't be going away now. Martin was silent. Then he said, as one who answers some accusation, No, why should I wish me ill, Ellen? I never did thee any harm. No, she said very simply, and looking away from him. Thou only came and went away again, Martin. She was looking at the cat, the curve of her cheek, the fullness of her mouth, the sheen of the black hair touching her waist. He could drink it all in. Folk are free to come to a place and free to go away again, said Martin, a thin note of antagonism, of self-defence, in his rational tone. He was thinking of a tragedy that had happened at a farm on a hillside not distant, of a moment's passion in a man for which a woman must pay dear to the end of her days. The man had gone away. I never am thee, Alan, he said proudly. Folk are free to come and go, aren't they, when they leave a lass as they find her, and leave no trouble behind. Her eyes turned from their survey of the cap with its peculiar blind stare, an hungry licking of its chops with the red tongue, to rest on Martin's face. There was a consciousness of moral strength stamped upon it, a loop passed over it in lightning scorn. That feels an angel compared with Tim Green, she said, reading his thoughts so well that he almost started. He will be wrought by too little thought, and sometimes by too much. Tim took Matty and left her. It were all a possession he knew. When thou goes away, who is there I could wed straight, Martin Scott, with thee in my ear and my ears, I in my very dreams and eats, in my very blood, as the air of four gates is part of me. What thou's left is hardly worth the tacking. Leave no trouble behind, leave a lass as they find her, she laughed. Through the orthodox moralities of Fourgates, and all other places like it, she shot a shaft of ridicule. Martin was pondering what to say to her. Will ta leave me as they found me? she asked. Will ta? Can I get back to that place where I were before that came? Before I thought of thee? Can I tear thee out of my life, just because thou's gone away, and has done me no harm, in way Tim as I'm Matty? Are there no other bonds than flesh bonds, no other debts of honour but those? Aren't there looks and words and thoughts that be forged in fire as much as if Parson muttered them? Are there no children, women nuss in their dreams that belong as much to some men who left them as any that go clothed in flesh and able to suck the longing from a woman's breast just because they are flesh? Her words came out in a torrent. It was an iron creed. It was so old that it seemed startlingly new. It was the creed of the sacredness of first love, such as a tribal savage would have held, ere the complexities of modern life placed a barrier between body and soul, gave leave to love and depart fetterless, if that the law said that no harm had been done. Its narrowness, its amazing claim, took away Martin's breath. But, he said, then paused for words. Then he went on, rather haltingly, How many men and women are there in four gates, or any other place for that, who wed the one they first thought on and kissed? She did not speak. Like a sullen savage, she sat on the old settle, stubborn, unconvinced by any arguments he could pour. A wildness of something near despair shot through him. Why was she not more like the women of Fourgates? Why did she always make it so hard, so uncomfortable for him? Why could she not put herself on one side? As many women might, smile and say, Go and be happy, Martin, it is right. That's the curse on thee, he said in a hard tone. Thou forgets. Can't I pass it on and on and on forever? To put others through all this we're going through, to leave it all to be fought over, that the last of the masons, can't I not be brave enough to say, it shall end here? Helen looked at him, 
Flint met Flint. From the collision, sparks were struck. The little kitchen faded from the can of both. They were fighting each other now, fighting in animal self-preservation. Martin's fear of staying and its consequences. Alan's fear of his going and its consequences, wrestling with each other. A savagery flashed into Alan's eyes. Martin's held the cruel tolerance of a modern judge, dealing with reasons. Cursed am I, she cried with a rebellion against the decree of gods and men alike, blazing through her. Why, because I might have a child that were gladder or sadder than most, at the coming up at noon, or because it might fancy itself a prince when its pockets were empty, or because it might, in some minute, plunge a knife into what it loved. Sane men do that every day in calendar. Mean men and weaklings and cowards are bred every day at week and walk streets in the sun and aren't ashamed. What if I'd bore an idiot? Somewhere between man and dog his mind would come. Would he be less happy? Would he be less loved? Cursed am I? I defy the curse. If I weren't born to be happy, let me dee. I were born to live, to love. Who shall say to me I weren't? Thee tell me if thou can, tell me this once, and I'll say no more words. Say to me, in face all these women's breasts, that I were born to be treated like a leper. Call on thy saints, and what the priest told thee, and what folk gabble to mock the living sun in the sky and the flowers in the fields, and tell me, a living, breathing woman, to go down to me grave in lone dark, like a cursed creature. Tell me that, Martin Scott, if thou durst. She had torn open her bodice, savagely. She was far away from four gates and its tenets now. She might have been some high priestess of nature's, imbued with the holiness of life and its aspirations, and scorn of those who ran from its battles. From every tone, loop, from every inch of her tall form, issued a majestic pride, defiance and dignity. A loop said, Blaspheme now if thou can. They stood looking at each other. It was the cry of the human heart against the bondage of customs ethics, against the fears of the human mind. She was daring his cold saints to protect him now. Slowly, like a man beside himself, Martin moved to order. Her hair showered about her like a veil, but through it came the moonlight gleam of her breasts. Her arms, their whiteness hidden by the ugly body sleeves, were crossed over her breast, so that there was now a look of primitive shrinking in her attitude. But her eyes met his, filled with a look of scorn. The pure shamelessness of her cast a radiance about her, the little hollow under her proud throat, the dusky holy veil of woman's hair flowing over those gleaming breasts like a cloud half hiding the moon. They made her look fair as the mother of God, but never had any painter painted a Madonna of so valiant a look. It was as if she had declared her right to be the mother of men by the rare and simple virtue of courage, courage that would dare all, risk all, can't you tell me now to go and dee and rock, content and Christian like? Can't you, Martin? she asked. Martin groaned. Ellen, he pleaded, his voice shoot like a reed in the wind. He was looking in awe at what he had prayed against two nights before. It was not Ellen that he saw before him, asking him to tell her to rot and lie in a lonely grave accursed. It was life warm, pulsating human life, shut off and thrust aside by some whim of fate, crying out and calling, calling louder than the voices of iron laws, social customs, priests, philosophers and schoolmasters, saying, Why, why, why? She had put him in the place of the judge, the Pharisee, but before he condemned her, she had bidden him look at her. Hush, he said in torment, Thou can't leave me, Martin, thou can't, she was saying. He was trying to get back, back to the firm strand of reason on which he had stood during these last days, back to the peace that had been growing in his mind. 
He was looking away and his eyes fell on the niche in the wall where Abel Mason had once told him that his grandfather had put the bloody rags he had ripped from his throat, the grandfather on the maternal side, from which the madness sprung, the grandfather whose name had given no clue for years that this Abel Mason was a branch from that old man who had died, cursing his destiny. Martin, the agony of the cry pierced his brain. Had he turned his head, he would have seen that the thick hair was covered over the swell of the white bosom, eclipsing its beauty. Under the old bodice, her heart was beating in a woman's panic of agony and fright. She had come back to four gates. Exultation was over. She was no high priestess. She was a woman, a cheek sot and cold with wonder as to what Martin might think, if he would understand. She belonged to four gates. It claimed her remorselessly. Courage was big, but four gates' soil was round her roots. Fear was upon her. She had dared, she had walked over burning ploughshares to open the eyes of Martin's soul. She had used white magic, but she had used it as a priestess, not a courtesan, because she was a four gates woman who had lived from childhood with the storm rack of the moor and of destiny. But Martin might not understand. She had tried to snatch fire from heaven. To get it, she had walked through hell. She had risked all. Martin! It was the child's cry of terror at the threat of darkness again. Their dual voices rang together now. In them both was still the sound of the struggle. In their voices was the sound of Martin listening to his pale saints and Ellen crying out from the tabernacle inhabited by spirits of earth moulded out of the red clay and the salt seas. No, no, she could only mourn as though against the dark. Her voice was faint, her arms had fallen to her side, her chin was sunk on her breast. Martin did not look at her. Better sorrow now than in twenty years, he said. Helen, thou thank me some time, when in years to come. When we are dead, she moaned. Martin, but the thought that he could leave her now stunned her. It's like dying, Helen, said Martin. Oh, it's hard. But my son might have this to fight to stand just here like this. It's sin we dally with. I'm only a man, Ellen. I daresn't look at thee any more. To a sin to tempt me. For three generations, Ellen, it would be. And on and on. A mad race cursing us when we're dead. Think, Ellen. She was standing like somebody in marble and ebony. She saw him. Saw his shadow on the wall. Crossing himself. The man who in those two moments of crisis had been compelled to return for sustenance to the faith of his childhood against the spell of life and love. She saw him open the door, saw him through the mist of this bad dream in which she could not cry out. Not only her tongue was dumb, cleaving her mouth in a great panic, but her very brain had lost its function. She tried to think of one word to say, only one word to cry aloud, to keep him from going through the doorway. It seemed as if she had never known words, never heard them, never learnt even the simplest. Something whispered to her in a formless sort of way that perhaps she was going mad, was joining that long and shadowy line of the accursed whom Martin had thrust her with. How long she stood thus she did not know. It might have been only a few seconds, it might have been an eternity. But when the sound of the closing door came to her, a galvanic shock went through her. Something woke up in that dumb brain. She rushed to the closed door. Martin! 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 The cry rang out, the fierce intensity that made the air quiver again. She was beating with pale, helpless hands against the door. Quite suddenly, she perceived that all she had to do was to lift the latch, and then she could get outside. She was still calling that name, but almost without knowing it, and running down the hillside through the long wet grass, heedless of who might hear her. She was not conscious of anything except that Martin was going away, and that she must stop him. She was running, stumbling, crying, shouting for her soul to come back. Once she thought she saw Martin, that he had turned at her cry, 
and something of a perception that, if she were not out of her senses, she was very miserable, came to her dimly. She ran more quickly. It could not be true. Martin could not be leaving her. Nothing so awful could be true. That was what she told herself. Surely that was Martin, away down the hill. Only there was a strange heavy mist upon everything, on the earth, on the trees, in the sky. She must hurry. She could overtake him before he reached the bottom of the hill, or entered on the road that ran past the houses, where curious faces could peep. She remembered that she had not fastened her bodice, and tried vainly to fasten it with one hand as she ran. What matter? Martin was going away, and she could not let him go, for what four gates might think of her? Then the whole sky seemed to turn to a hellish blaze of red. A sight was bathed in blood. Through the red blindness she heard the evening birds piping. Again she wondered if that was how people heard the sounds of life when they lay in the tomb. The red turned into pitch black, pitch black everywhere, through which she groped dizzily, trying to clutch at something to hang on to. But her hands only clutched that empty air all weird and black. Martin was going away, and something was happening to her. Her heart had missed half a beat, maybe. She was swooning, like any weakling woman who wept by the fireside. A rage against herself tore through her brain. Weak fool, she stammered, condemning herself and bringing all the force of her will to bear, struggled against it. She stood quite still, then tried to find something solid again. Her hand touched something, a man's coat. Martin, she cried. He had turned back then. He could not leave her. She began to laugh chokingly. Now the terror was past. Things were dim yet, the sky far away, but the birds did not seem as if she heard them through grave loam. She clutched the man's sleeve. The mist began to clear from her sight. The wind blew her hair about. Something of ecstasy stirred in her. He had not gone. Tomorrow she must punish him. Not even Martin could go unpunished for putting her through this agony. But now, just now, she held him with a lost child's panic. Then, with the suddenness of a sword thrust, she heard Day's voice say callously, A bit of a mistake. Scott's gone. But blast it. I'll do as well, won't I? Thou mun shut thy ear like they're shut now, all the time. And think it same. Ellen's eyes opened wide, staring into his grinning countenance. They had an uncanny look, those eyes, appearing to gaze into boundless darkness. Gone, she said tonelessly. After that dizzy joy she had felt, the waters of despair rushed over her. She went deep under them with a hopeless shudder. She would never come up again. She knew it. It was worse than pain. It was death. Aye, said Day's voice a long way off. He's gone, but I'm here. She heard herself laugh. She ought to be weeping, weeping tears of blood. She was laughing instead. The sound reminded her of a broken whistle Martin had played on when first he came to the farm. Something had happened to it, and all the music had gone, though the note stops were left. What a queer pain it was to die suddenly and hear the world go on. Aye, I'm here, she heard Day's voice, and one chap's as good as another, isn't he? His arm went round her, drew her close to him. He was kissing her lips. She had once felt that she would die of shame if any but Martin kissed her. She'd been mistaken. It didn't hurt a bit. What was that he had said? One man as good as another? She heard herself laugh again. She'd lived all these years and never thought of it. I'll take thee, Day went on, as if she were in the left luggage department. She laughed once more. Even if a man is taking a woman for financial gain, it hurts his vanity to be laughed at. It hurt Day's. Stop thy damn laughing, he said, shaking her by the shoulders. I said I'd take thee, just to you. Her eyes stared into his. There was laughter in them beside which tears would have been like comedy. Wilter, that very good, she answered, with something finer than scorn in her tones. It stung the tramp through his coarse rind. All o'er four gates, it said, thou's hung thy cellar, Martin. 
he said, still holding her by the shoulders. When they look at thee through their windows as they goes by, that's what they'll be thinking, how he's run away fra thee. There was a quiver about the lips, the pride of her stirred. She withdrew herself from his grasp, her gaze fixed itself on the evening sky with the moon leering vacantly back at her. She was thinking that four gates, and particularly this hillside, had once seemed beautiful to her. Now it seemed that she was caught here in this bowl of the darkening hills. She could not run away from four gates. She was of the breed who live and die in a place. Four gates was her world. She could no more step out of it than she could have deserted Martin. But Martin had gone away from her, into that unknown beyond the hills. I'll take thee, said Day again. He was stuffing his pipe with tobacco and leaning against a tree, whilst watching her narrowly. She had flung herself at Martin, all for nothing. She was tasting bitter waters. Well, he asked her at length, betwixt pipe, stem and teeth. If thou likes, she answered. The apathy of the tone was in striking contrast to the white flame of her face. That means it, he queried. She nodded her head in assent. Why? he began. She was beginning to move slowly up the hillside to that house, emptied of joy and torment now. She turned her head sideways, her eyes set in that strange smiling stare, met his. Because that the first asked me, she said, and because I don't care. I've done all caring I can. I've got through it, and I'm not going to wear the willow. Thou understands, he said, facing her grimly. Thou'll be mine. Aye, she acquiesced. He still regarded her in a bewildered way. He had expected some struggle, a longer chase. She had fallen into his hand with no more resistance than a dead thing. He gripped her by the arm suddenly. Brute passion was in his eyes. Mind, body and soul, he said, savagery in his voice. Consciousless as he was, something urged him on to set the case before her. She drew herself up with a gesture of pride. Soul, she laughed. Nay, how much does to want for thy money? Women sell their bodies at Brungley, I've heard. A parson once talked to him selling their souls, these painted women. He'd ne'er been a woman, that was why. He'd have known they had none, else. What they sell is flesh, like they throw to tigers at Brungley Fair. Well, flesh then, said Day, grinning. He drew her to him. Her passivity reminded him of a woman he had once seen dragged from a canal. There was something of the same stare on her face, too. His kisses had the unrestraint of a savage sucking at a bone. Give me the body and I'll take chances on the soul, he grinned, releasing her so suddenly that she almost fell. She regained her balance, looking at the evening sky and did not answer. What's to get out of it? he asked as they moved on again through the long wet grass. There were some folk in Brungle who got sick of selling stuff cheap, she said, so they threw it away to go rotten, to make sure it shouldn't be offered at twice, she smiled. What I get out of the bargain is just that, security. Again Martin coming back, he asked. She nodded. He'll not, she remarked, with the tone of an outsider contemplating the whole from an impartial standpoint, but she stared at the sky again. That could have committed suicide, he said. And folk guess, she smiled, and him be sure, that would be stupid. Besides, I have committed suicide, only there'll be no coroner's inquest. There may be hell after, he grinned. She was silent. Her face said that she did not care. Her end was a barrier, a barrier of flesh and blood. The more devilish, the more of security it gave against any weakness of hers for Martin Scott. I'm a sort of insurance against fire, grinned Day. She nodded. They were nearing the gate. The sharp scent of lad's love came to them. As they passed it, she bent down in a casual way and tried to pull it up by the roots. It was the bush Martin had set years ago. Kneeling there on the flagstone, she tugged at it until it came up, she hurled it from her, as if it had been some loathsome thing. 
Somebody's coming, said they, as she arose. Fasten thy bodies. You might get thee an ill name, he grinned. Up the hillside came the sound of drunken singing. Passing into the farm kitchen, Ellen covered the bit of bared white net. Her father had come in and was curved over the fire. Where's Martin? he asked, looking up. Ellen was on the hearthstone now, fastening up her hair. He poked the fire into a blaze to see her face better. Gone, she answered, without turning into the kindly shadows. Her voice had its own tone, save that it had fallen half a note. But he watched her hands, empty of the air now. They were plucking her dress restlessly with a little monotonous movement. Her lips were white and her teeth caught them at times. She drew her chair up to the table and began to eat. Not hungry, aren't I? he asked. Haven't I been eating? No, she asked, clattering cup and spoon about. Haven't I been ill? He watched her. She was eating, actually eating bread that must taste like dust, swallowing life down, emptied as it was of joy. What a creature the gods had given him to torture. Men could eat with their hearts torn out, he knew. But women, he watched her, pushing mouthful after mouthful, down by sheer will. So that better, he remarked. I am better, she answered, reaching for the salt dredger. I'm fain, he said. Where's Day? Alan did not answer, for Day had opened the door. Here, he said. There was a note of triumph in his voice. He passed round to the back of Alan's chair. The light from the lamp lit up the rigidity of her face. There was a ghastliness about her before which a lesser man might have trembled awed into a seemliness towards something great as death. It was weird, as if that coffin corpse upstairs should essay to eat. Fielding Day looked over her head towards the old man in the corner. He winked coarsely and meaningly, then laid his finger and thumb on the nape of the white neck. She's going to be wed, he told the old man, aren't we, lass? He compelled her to turn that one face up to his by the pressure of his thumb. There was something in his attitude that reminded Mason of the handling of a hair. Eh? jerked the old man. Then he burst into laughter. Ha ha ha! I don't believe it, he said. Ellen turned her gaze upon him. It's true, she said, reaching out for another piece of bread. He rose from his chair. Let's see they kiss a lad, he said, with stimulated tenderness. Ellen pushed her chair back from the table. Day caught her by the arm. A good neat kiss, he said. She submitted passively to the indignity of the coarse caresses, such as she had received on the hillside. Then, as she was turning away, Day pulled her back to him and kissed her again. He left a blotch of tobacco slaver on her cheek and laughed. As to finished, she asked quietly. He nodded, letting her stagger again. Without wiping the brown spittle from her cheek, she took her candle. It was at this juncture that a loud thumping fell on the door. "'Go see who tis, Helen,' said the old man. She went to the door with the candle lit and opened it. "'Somebody to screw up in their wooden suit, isn't there?' said a stuttering voice. "'I've been told she lives here. Where is she? What I says is, have a good time, you'll be a long time dead. Where is she?' This is Mason's farm, in it, where that dead woman lives. Come tomorrow, said Alan. You're drunk, Jabus. He stared at her, suddenly realising that the door was open. Drunk, he said indignantly. Drunk? And he lurched in through the doorway. And if I am, shunt them as he's drunk, fossin' up them as he's sober. Which room is she in? All right, everything's in order, everything's in order. Show him the way, Alan said old Mason. He can't hurt Millie anyhow. Jabus was staring at Helen in one of those lulls that come to drunken men. Candle in hand, she was looking at him. The stillness and whiteness of her seemed to hypnotise him. Then he let out a yell at ten thousand demons. She's got up, he shouted, and dashed through the doorway. Helen closed the door after him and went up to bed. Abel Mason stretched out his hand today. Then he went to a drawer, taking out a fat bag, and emptied its contents on the table. The gold shone in the lamplight. Twenty to be going on with, he said. His lips moved as he counted. 
Days moved also. They had to count over again. As he said, Mason had given him one too little. Aye, there were but nineteen, said Mason. He watched Day scrape it into an old purse he had brought from the doss house. Then he leaned towards him across the table. What's to think on her? he asked, leering. Day's eyes met his with the same look. The old man's eyes narrowed. It was as if he would pour into the tramp's very being. The fear was on him again. He was afraid that this man gloating over the little pile of sovereigns, and with the wolfish face more wolfish still in its double lust, might so far awake to Ellen's spell as to be an inefficient tool of his revenge. Did Tavel love a woman failed? he asked. Day started, looked up. The bestial expression of his face shattered. Aye, he said jerkily. My mother. She shut door on me whenever I went, and sure did I not go to her funeral. And she left me her curse in her will. That's the stock I come on. That all right, failed, said the old man meditatively. But did ta notice her eyes, failed? Did ta notice her eyes? Day left him, shaking with laughter over the fire. He had to pass Ellen's room and listen for any sound from within. The silence from that other room where the dead lay was not more deep. Creeping stealthily, he placed his eye to the keyhole. He saw her. She was sitting by the table on which stood the candle. She was biting into her own flesh, biting into that bared white arm to discover whether she were really dead or only in a trance. Those eyes, with that loot that had made Mason laugh, were closed. Her lashes fluttered once. He moved cautiously away. Then he shrugged his shoulders. Just for a single second, he had felt fear, lest she should unclose those eyes, and know he had looked at her 